Okay, hi everyone, and thank you for coming um, this evening to the second lecture in our AAXX 100 lecture series in this centenary year where we're celebrating 100 years of women at the AA. Um, I'm Manije Verghese, I'm the head of lectures and the public program curator, and I'm also a member of the AAXX 100 steering committee. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, the AAXX 100 project aims to not only celebrate the contribution of AA women over the last 100 years, but it also serves as a catalyst for a wider discussion about women in architecture. And the project has been a multimedia project of exhibitions, lectures, workshops, walking tours, publications, and a website. And it culminates this term uh, with three strands, an exhibition across the hall in the gallery and up the stairs, uh, a book uh, co-edited by Lynn Walker and Elizabeth Darling, and a conference that was just held on the 2nd to the 4th of November. <clears throat> so, but moving to tonight's event, we're delighted to have Japanese architect Kumiko Inoue here with us tonight to talk about her ongoing research in a talk titled Little Spaces and Several Trials. Um, personally, this is also very exciting for me because when I first joined the AA as a third year student, um, I went on a unit trip with Inter 6, which was taught at the time by Jonathan Dawes, who's also here tonight. <laughs> Um, and we visited Kumiko's office and she talked to us about her work and her fascination at the time with visual and perceptual effects, which was what we were studying. And we visited her Dior store and a few of her other projects that she designed. And I found the whole experience so inspiring, I jumped at the chance to invite her back to talk to, the, uh, to students and friends of the AA tonight. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank A plus U magazine who have collaborated with us and, and made it possible for us to bring Kumiko here tonight. And um, last academic year, we brought uh, the, we, we worked with them to bring Go Hasegawa here. And uh, it's a great collaboration that we hope will continue going forward. So to briefly introduce Kumiko Inoue, she was born in Osaka and studied at the Tokyo University of Arts, but before traveling to the United States to do a master's at the Yale School of Architecture. She worked at Jun Aoki and Associates from 1996 before establishing her own office, um, the office of Kumiko Inoue in 2000. Um, she now teaches at the Yokohama Graduate School of Architecture, and her prolific list of projects also include one of the A plus U offices in um, Tokyo, Aoyama House, as well as several projects for Dior and across different typologies, including housing, education, and public space. Um, she's currently working on a community development project in Miyazaki and a campus development project for Kyoto City University of Arts with other architects. So tonight's lecture will focus on this research project called Little Space and there's some publications on the table here that we encourage you to come and have a closer look at after the lecture. So um, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Kamiko Inoue to the AA. Thank you very much for the uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to have this uh, opportunity to present my uh, work today. And my name is Kumiko Inui. Now I, I have my own office to do my practice and uh, teach at uh, Yokohama uh, Graduate School of Architecture, YGSA, uh, which belongs to the uh, Yokohama National University. And uh, Sejima-san and Nishizawa-san uh, from uh, SANA uh, also teaches at uh, YGSA. And uh, before I start uh, the presentation, let me uh, introduce my position among Japanese architects. Uh, this illustrates uh, my original and selfish four quadrant matrix. Uh, horizontal axis uh, shows the tendency of design, uh, conservative and progressive. The vertical axis shows an another tendency of design individualism and anonymous. Uh, the big master, Sana, is in the first quadrant. The, their expression is very progressive and I think their way of creation is uh, personal and individual. Another master, Toyo Ito, is also in the same quadrant. However, the Toyo Ito is in milder position. Since recently, Toyo Ito repeats the comments that shows his doubt about individual expression. So Fujimoto is in the first and more extreme than Sana. 
I believe. Another, uh, above the name of Fujimoto, you can see the word J. Yes? Uh, this is Junya Ishigami. And he is much more extreme than Fujimoto, and he almost is out of range. Architects graduated from Tokyo Tech University, one of the most important architecture schools in Japan, occupied the separately each own delicate position. Their pursuit of severe criticality makes them to position in unique point. <laughs> then where is my position? I personally think that I occupy around here. That. I am an architect who has a little doubt whether the personal expression is needed. However, I, doubt, I don't want my design uh, would be conservative. Hence, I am in the second quadrant. The second quadrant is rather difficult to understand. Honestly speaking, I think the architects in this quadrant are not well known outside Japan. I think Mr. Kitayama, a former principal of YGSA, is in this quadrant. People and works of this quadrant are lack of show showiness. So today, uh, you have to be patient to hear my rather quiet presentation. Are you ready? <laughs> so over the past 10 years, many architects in Japan have shown an interest in the bottom-up design. In Japan, the community development with citizens' participation was sprouted out in 1970s. That was the opposition by the citizens who pursued the democracy. They opposed the top-down urban planning that assigned the highest priority to the economy and the politics. This shows the famous example of such a bottom-up community development called Hanegi Play Park, done by the group of housewives in Setagaya Ward in Tokyo. They changed a normal public park where there are lots of prohibited matters to the place where the children can do anything. There are a lot, lot of examples of those in Japan. However, they had little to do with the architectural design. Then, around 2000, some young architects came to be influenced by that kind of bottom-up community development. In Japan, it is often said that the volunteer activities became generalized during the disaster relief activity of the Great Hanshin Awaji earthquake in 1995. The generation who experienced the volunteer activities when they were college student or high school student, showed the changes in attitude towards society. They came to be strongly interested in the way, the new way of design that would change the society better. As a result, their interest connected to the existing bottom-up movement, and they uh, operate it in different way from what had been done before. They tried to gen generalize grassroots activities that used to be engaged only by some citizens with strong awareness. And lots of architects project, uh, architectural projects and community development projects have been born since then, especially after the great East Japan earthquake in nine, uh, 2011, the bottom-up design has came to be the real culture beyond the temporary trend. 
I like this cultural change, and I myself sometimes engage in such bottom-up design projects that make citizens participate. At the same time, I am frustrated by the situation where the bottom-up projects are judged only by the processes. Architecture exists as if it were the tools for the sake of the domestic, democratic way of design. Instead, I am interested in how such bottom-up design produces the architectural delightness and charm. Having this interest, I started to research what people expect from our environment in 2014. The subject of the investigation are not the scenes where the people just enjoy the space as consumers, but the scenes where people voluntarily approach to the space to obtain their own comfortableness. I organized a research team with my student from my former university, Tokyo University of the Arts, and thoroughly research and collect the various examples of scenes that shows the interplay of people and the environment. Student and me and my assistants from my office, total 10 of us had been working on this for almost seven months taking pictures. The result of this research was published as a book titled Little Spaces. This is a book shown on the screen. And places we researched were everywhere in Japan, including city, local city, suburb, and countryside. We ended up with a total of 18,000 pictures of examples. They were refined into 2,000 examples for publishing, making 150 groups. Uh, lots kind of examples were gathered. This is an example from a small fishing port. The piloty space of this fisherman's union has been changed as the living room, where the fishermen would gather after their morning sessions. This is a gathering place for women. Someone happened to a place, a tent on the top, at the gap of the tight embankment. I'm sure it feels nice here, where the wind blows through. They choose a place wherever they like out of their surroundings and turning them into where they like to stay. We have many examples of those kinds of gathering space for neighbors. Fulfillment of everyday life would depend on whether you have such places to communicate. We can still find such places for little communities, both in rural areas and also in the city. Those places are useful, usually handmade by various things the neighbors bring in. So the interior components are usually unorganized. They are far from sophistication. This is an example of marketplaces. Marketplaces are treasure house of spots where people voluntarily approach to the space to obtain their own comfortableness. In order to support busy marketplace activities, all spots of the environment are thoroughly customized. Those kind of bottom-up activities acted by normal people are just great. Then one strong question occurs to me. How the architecture planning and design can accept the bottom-up activities by people? In Japan, there have been a great discussion about the design methodology that uh, broadly accept bottom-up requirement from users. For example, some studies by Christa, Christopher Alexander has claimed that the project conducted only by bottom-up process is effective. He practiced real project 
that demanded people's participation in every process. This photo shows his trial done in Japan. Those were great trials. However, it has became clear that the project couldn't reach the richness the mature environment normally have. Despite that, their procedures were very detailed. The problem seems to lie in the fact that he expected the process only before the completion too much. In order to overcome that, what Alexander done and to reach to the new design methodology, I made a hypothesis. Top-down design idea is required to the project. The bottom-up recovery ideas that make full use of the top-down idea must be expected during planning. Bottom-up ideas must be thought of during after the completion. However, such top-down ideas are not for the self-assertion as an architect. Instead, I expect not that the top-down ideas suffocate bottom-up desire, but that the top-down idea triggers the bottom-up activities. The one is natural and common. I take two seriously. I think that if two is realized, then three is also realized. The reason why I came up with such a conclusion is because I encountered the concept disturbance in the field of ecology. A disturbance is a temporary change in environmental conditions that causes pronounced change in an ecosystem. Major disturbance include fires, flooding, windstorm, and so on. Since it prevents the succession of the forest towards the climax, it is said that it can produce the biodiversity within an ecosystem. The process through a uh, process sought as demolitions rather relates to the production. Influenced by such concept, I consider the top-down ideas that occur during planning as one kind of disturbance. Then I accept that the disturbance caused the bottom-up recoveries some bottom-up recoveries are undertaken by planners during when the project is in the planning phase. Furthermore, other bottom-up recoveries are undertaken by users during when it is used after completion. As a result, I assume this process helps the variety and the richness of the architectural environment to occur. I will introduce some of my works based on those thought. Now I would like to present some of them by starting off with this house that we designed. It was rather after we finished the research. And so we directly applied our achievement to design this house. And this is a house for a family of four at the city center. The site is at the west part of central Tokyo. The red circle shows where the site is, where it was part of the housing district with the grid block pattern. But now a main road was newly constructed by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government. All roads alongside this road were sliced diagonally. The site of my client, the site of my clients was also sliced, and it is now almost almost a thin slice of land. Furthermore, since all the roads were cut diagonally by this road, the sites alongside this road have a wide 
variety in size. Therefore, the size of the buildings that strongly relate to the size of the land have a wide variety in scale. Relatively tall condominiums and small detached houses are mixed together. This was the situation of the surroundings, typical situation under the Japanese urban planning uh, regulation, where the size and the shape of the building is regulated only by floor area ratio. Under such condition, I thought that the villa type house is not adequate. Instead, a kind of townhouse must be needed. To begin with, I straightforwardly designed a house with Japanese townhouse vocabulary, EIPS. EIP is an effective factor from the Japanese context, bringing together the street and the inside. Also, we uh, collected main, many examples of them for little spaces, my research. We think EVES is a good uh, starting point. However, by simply putting an EVES for a building would lead to the problems that it boards as an architecture. The reason is because EVES act as a decoration. What we should learn from little spaces is how each specific activities and uh, space are inseparable, inseparable, and now wonderfully they would form a kind of ecosystem. We wanted to find out how to integrate the activity, space, and the surroundings. So for this house M, we gave a try for the related, repeated eaves, inclined and different angles for each floor. This was a change of viewpoint. I threw the form of architecture into the project in top-down approach. It has a pretty odd form. Let me explain one by one. First, I wanted to use this form to handle the relationship with uh, surroundings, which would differ for each floor. For the first floor, the slab is looking just like an eave. This provides the slightly closed mood for the inside, keeping some privacy from the street. While the showing the familiar face toward the street, welcoming the passers-by, by e as, as eaves would do in general. For the second floor, both slabs are inclined openly toward the street, creating an openly atmosphere for the living room. Both ends of the upper and lower slab wouldn't easily enter the site, enter the site from the inside. And the street is closed here since the floor height is minimized. So the place is almost united with the street. For the third floor, the two slabs are closed towards the street. So the bedroom is placed on this floor where the privacy is important. And this is how we tried to create a variety of different degrees of privacy for a house. By using the form of slabs floating in different directions for each floor. If you look at the plan, you may see that the depth is uh, 3.1 meters long at the most and it is only 2.6 meter long on the south floor. The rooms are very shallow, and most of the places are spaces simply enclosed underneath the eaves. What, it's, what it establishes the concept of making a house only with eaves is the uh, shallowness of the house. You want to feel exactly enclosed, even when you are inside the room and all the spaces are airy, 
just like standing under an eave. Then, if simply having, handling the degree of privacy for the differing floor was the only aim, it might not have to do, have such a complex form. However, I felt that this complicated form was indispensable here, since it was very important to generate the ecosystem of architecture and activity that I had mentioned before. Here, I had expectations for such odd form to push forward that act of designing. For example, those three slabs are eaves, but they are also acting as slopes at the same time. Eaves are useful, but the slopes are awfully troublesome for a house. Many devices are necessary to accept this form as a house. Another layer of wooden floor was built on top of the slab in order to obtain a horizontal floor. So we allowed some part of the slab underneath to show, acting as some kind of an earth floor. Or since the floor is inclined, the distance away from the street differs according to where you are standing. And so we fixed a bench where the street approached the closest in hope that you might start a conversation with the people on the street. Otherwise, making the most of the diagonal line at the end edge of the eaves, resulting by the inclined slab and the trapezoid shape of the land, and collecting the rainwater nicely and letting them flow, and so on. So many adjustments were made in order to make the most of the accumulated inclined slabs. We were expecting ourselves as designers to enjoy this process itself to start with. That is, rather than to directly apply the motif that we collected from the little spaces. We expected little spaces to naturally emerge within this very project, while we were undergoing the process of designing. Furthermore, we did not expect this process to take place thoroughly for the designer. That is, it will not end when the architecture is completed, but will hopefully go on and architecture will be occasionally transformed by the client. So far, the house is looking exciting with a huge palm tree, a mailbox, and various decorations added by the client. So the, in the beginning, I, I, I adopted a little old architectural form called the three uh, inclined slabs. Then it has followed that this form generates the unique situation that both the planner and the clients conceived various ideas. It, this was the very small trial. However, it suggests that the dynamic process, how bottom-up process and top-down process can relate. I will present an another bigger project. It is one of the disaster recovery projects for the Great East Japan earthquake. But I was thinking about how we might achieve the little and libraries, lively spaces among this project, just like we did for the House M. Shichigahama is a peninsula town, and is 30 minutes away by car from the city center of Sendai, one of the biggest cities. It is a very beautiful place with a swimming beach and the pine trees stretch out. The traditional 
、えー、サイトスイニングスポット松島 is near the site This is a ukiyo-e drawing by Hiroshige a famous painter Shichigahama is portrayed in this drawing Then the Shichigahama was damaged by the tsunami waves The coastline was broken and broad part of the residential area and rice fields was damaged by tsunami. The center part of the peninsula where the junior high school stood is a small hill. And they have actually escaped from the tsunami wave damages. However, the junior high school itself was greatly damaged by the shaking of the earthquake. Now, then in Japan, there are many、uh, interesting features for a school as a building type. Firstly, public schools are not used just as schools. After school hours, most students stay for their club activities for sport, music, or art. Many events open to the area. Such as athletic festivals and the cultural festivals are held. It is used as election polling places and also serves as important evacuation facilities at the time of the, a disaster. Thus, the school, schools are also functioning as a community center for the local area. Probably for this reason, most of schools are used with surprisingly ample of space compared to other public facilities. Small work sheds and barns are casually built and planned among the school premises, pro- premises. And this is adding to this familiar look for schools throughout in Japan. It may be recognized as a kind of culture. It was a sample of this Shichigahama Junior High School. Workshed for the garden, gardening and clearing, clearing, cleaning were built here and there. And you can see that the activities of the students were spread, spread to the utmost of the premises. Not limited only to the inside of the buildings. I feel that the more you have such unplanned devices, the most abundant, abundant the environment will become. Hence, it might sound too straightforward, but we made our proposal with shade all over the place. Our purpose was not to regenerate the landscapes of the farmers, former school with、uh, many shed, but to follow the whole concept of school, bearing this kind of culture to make the most of the premises by casually adding shed. Still, to create a school was the main object. object. So, we had to consider how to handle this door's shed from the architectural planning point of view. Our idea was to freely combine the two motifs of large frames and small structure. We wanted, to, we wanted the very simple frame structure for the main body. Likewise, A similar simple frame is added to the main body. We call this little space, we call this a little space for this project and keep on adding, keep on going. By planning the space in this way, the activity that was、uh, formerly limited to the spaces made by the frames. We thought that they would spread out abundantly. 
Moreover, the space would smoothly correspond to the different scales of learning there are required those days according to the diversified education. The main body is made of the hollow square shape connected to each other, and the st structure itself was also allowed to develop freely. The main sm many small places in brown for this model are stuck to the main structure. This showed the completed images of little spaces and the main building. And this illustrates how some hollow square shapes are connected. Then enlarging the frame part in red, each of the hollow square shape units simply consists of classrooms and corridors. We attached many little spaces here. To adjust the conceptual idea to the reality, we tried to cl clarify the purpose and the numbers of little spaces. For example, we decided to place three for each grade, and then carefully the purpose of three. Also, we corresponded to the detailed functions requested for educational facilities, such as broadcasting room, small storehouse, and student council room. Especially for school design, the module of the classrooms, where in Japan the scale of eight meter by eight meter is the mainstream, is limiting the structural form of the building entirely. On the other hand, there are many programs that are incompatible with this classroom module, and this is letting down the purity of the school planning. With our method, we can easily attach those programs without any restriction by modules. So it is simple and unconstrained, and I like this idea to design school. Let's look at the entire picture. The red part shows the general rooms, such as classrooms. On the other hand, like this, entirely numbers of little spaces were scattered, which are small rooms and sheds. For this project, not all only places like sheds, where the people can go inside, we are called little space. But places like the, those benches or bookshelves at the corridor, at the corridor were all treated as little spaces and we went on attaching them. Once we started to design with an adding, adding attitude, we were gradually driven by this motif, motif to add anything that would work one after another. In Japan, classrooms are made for a student, a standard class of 40 students. In contrast to such basic learning spaces, the little space are used as a place to supplement the diversity of learning and uh, used for small group studies and another study kind of rooms. For this workplace, two sided are facing co the corridor, and the space is more united to the corridor compared to the former workplace that you saw. In this way, each workplace is planned to be unique in size and how they are arranged in order to provide more varieties of different learning environments. We tried to surround the rooms with many windows so that they can be kept free open during nice weather and during uh, 
clean apps. This idea to connect the hollow square shape had gave the several other advantages to our designing. The space given on the hull was not abundant. Since this was the disaster recovery project, and we were only given a limited amount of budget. Under such a condition, if we designed the school normally, the result would have been no more than the useful, usual classroom standing next to corridors. So we tried to create a small allowance of spaces where people would get together. And also we brought together each corridor at the joining part for different hollow square shapes, generating a place with enough room. This is one of the places where the hollow square shape are joined together. And this place is used for big student meetings. And this is the student council room. We also have a broadcasting room as little spaces, and another place independently organized by students. We noticed, noticed after the completion of the building that the students are utilizing those little spaces during school hours, break times, and after school, and also for the club activities. In this way, we made a school by creating the forms of adding on what is needed onto the base body of a simple school building, as well as we made the processes that combines top-down and bottom-up approach. You may remember I referred the term disturbance at the beginning of this lecture. I think the main building with hollow square shape was the disturbance of a top-down diagram of, for this project. And the little spaces are bottom-up elements that enriches rather schematic uh, diagram. And I will present an another disaster recovery project for the Great East Japan earthquake. Tony is in Kamaishi City, where the site situate is a compact fishing village overlooking small bay. The tsunami attacked this village and ran up to the blue line. The elementary school and the children's halls was attacked by the tsunami. Then the junior high school escaped from the tsunami by a hair breath. However, it structurally destroyed by the strong shake of the earthquake. Since the altitude of the junior high school property was the highest, the municipality and the local people decided to rebuild all three programs in the property. The strongly damaged, they strongly demanded the safest site that surely can avoid the next tsunami attack. So this red area illustrates the site. You can see that there are both a flat area and a deep-sided area. Since the flat area was used as the temporary schools and the temporary children's hall, the only area good for the construction was the remaining steep-sided hill. The red part illustrates it. The construction on the steep hill is difficult and expensive. Furthermore, the, since the damage of the Great East Japan earthquake was so enormous and widespread that each reconstruction project must be carried out with low budget. 
So this difficult situation made me to think deeply what the best solution is. And this shows the existing situation around the red area illustrated in the former image. The construction area situated behind the existing temporary schoolhouse. The level difference of the ground and the street above, street above was more than 25 meter, pretty steep. Then in the first phase, I tried to lay out buildings according to the contour lines. The reason was because it, was, it seems to reduce the cost. Furthermore, the group of buildings seems to be adapted to the landscape around it. Based on this contour alongside scheme, we tried to various variations. After we came up with the definite proposal, the, the municipality was received more detailed budget information from the national government. The new budget the national government indicated was very severe. Before we got this information, our studies were based on the idea that the building retained the soil pressure. The reason was because it minimized the construction cost in total. However, the reality, including political condition, was different. Since Japan is one of the country that the civil engineering industry is much, much stronger than the building industry. The budget for the civil engineering development was abundant. Despite this fact, the budget scale for the architectural project was very small. Then the option that requires the civil engineering process illustrated in this figure was much profitable for the political budgeting, despite that it costs more. I was not happy about this uh, irrational fact. However, I was in the position who must accept it. However, of course, I was afraid of doing landform preparation. The reason is because the landform preparation with civil engineering manner is always over human scale. Especially in the disaster area, we witnessed the overscale land modifications and the construction of gigantic uh, seawalls. Uh, this photo taken by a famous photographer, Naoya Hatakeyama, shows the uh, gigantic belt conveyor that carries the soil that is used for the enormous scale of the land elevation work in Rikuzen Takata where the whole town was destroyed by tsunami. However, before the modernization, the land forming used to be more small scaled. This illustrates the land form of the small local village in late 1960s, where it had not been modernized. It seems that the minimized land modification made the human scale place to live. Furthermore, my research, Little Space, tells that the small scale land form modification generates the rich and human environment. Considering these examples, I started the project again. And despite accepting the technology of modern civil engineering, I tried to make the landform human as much as possible. I tried various variations. I studied both the landform and the building layout at once. I tried lots of patterns, surveying what kind of layout fits to the landscape of village. 
the quality of space as a school for children was also taken into consideration. Furthermore, the approach road for the big dump trucks must be sold. We architect in Japan sometimes examine the execution scheme. However, we barely undertake the execution scheme of civil engineering. Then I invited the civil engineering consultant into our team. However, however the manner of thinking and drawing were, were so different that it was very difficult to communicate each other. And finally, our design team started to produce the physical model of execution scheme in order to understand the manner of landform preparation. Over one month, we continued to examine the land relationship between the landform and the layout of buildings. Then we found that the more we do it, the more notice how it difficult. This kind of layout illustrated in this image wastes the depth of the site. Then we were not able to plan the approach road for the dump. Furthermore, we tried to avoid the retaining wall produced by the modern civil engineering technology since it is always cold. However, we found that we were not able to avoid it in order to process the 25 meter high. Finally, we started examining the parallel layout. We also accept the modern retaining wall. Of course, we were afraid that we were obedient to what the civil engineering technology recommended. We are also afraid that the parallel pattern was very different in kind from the layout pattern of village. So being patient to such various discomfort, we continue to examine the possibility. Then gradually we came to know the point of contact between the landscape of the village and the formalistic parallel layout. We lay out retaining wall only in one direction as much as possible in order to soften the existing of them. Then the level difference of another direction was processed with the shallow slope of the embankment. In doing so, we tried to make the artificial landform to blend into the landscape around it. Then we have come to the conclusion that the parallel layout was not bothering. They even look like wrinkles in the natural landform that is somehow humorous. When that kind of shimir came up, the game is ours. In this way, we gradually inter interpreted the civil engineering technology. This shows final shape of the land shape, land form. This shows the layout of the schoolhouse. Each schoolhouse was very simple. There are wooden structure and have gable roof. There are six buildings. Like retaining wall in parallel la layout, all the circulations, such as corridor and the connecting corridor, were laid out parallel to the retaining wall. And furthermore, the circulations penetrate buildings, connect each other. And doing so, despite that the buildings are separated, the various uh, programs connect each other and form the networks of functions. And this shows the retaining wall and, uh, 
a shallow slope of embankment. And this shows the relationship between the site and the topology surrounding the site. It also shows the small bay of the, this village behind the building. The building with green roof was the old gymnasium that has recently uh, demolished. And this showed the cutting land level. There was set every four meter. That is the most effi efficient uh, distance according to the civil engineering regulation. And this showed the final land form. Most part was the cutting and some part was filling. And then this showed the layout of the schoolhouse. I set the level of the second floor of each schoolhouse, four meter, so that they can connect each other. For example, the second floor of the block three is on the same level of the first floor of block five. There are the small uh, gardens between the buildings. The ceiling height of lower floor four meter determined by the landform preparation was rather high for the wooden schoolhouse. Compared to the lower floor, I set up limited ceiling height for the upper floor in order to enhance difference. And this is the lower floor. It is spacious and bright. And this is the upper floor. And compared to the lower floor, it is quite low, that makes intimate atmosphere. The tilted ceilings also creates the different impression from the lower floor. All the buildings are facing two gardens, and the rooms on the second floor get the view to the sea. In short, every building is sandwiched by two gardens. Therefore, any part of the building is bright and cozy. Especially places overlooking the ocean view are great. Children can enjoy both the sea and the mountain. Addition to those characters, there are a variety of networks. This shows the connection of the lateral direction. Students and teachers can freely wander from place to place when it is sunny. On the longitudinal access, there are several connection, uh, connecting bridges. And this shows the block three on the left side and the block five on the right side. The connection corridor and the gardens are also shown in this photo. And furthermore, it shows the retaining wall on the right side, the land filling uh, surging into the gardens and softening the foot of the retaining wall is also shown. All the material and the technology is cheap and banal. However, by means of combining those materials and finding the nicer relationship, of those materials. I try to produce nice and human environment as much as possible. And this is the lowest uh, level plan. It is on the 23.5 meter above sea level. On this level, there is a children's hall and gymnasium. And this is the next level plan. It is on the 27.5 meter above sea level. And this is on the 31.5 meter above sea level. There are lots of general classrooms on this level. In addition to it, there is a teacher's office. And this shows the general classroom. Beside the classroom, there is a buffer area that can be used for any purpose. 
Uh, between the classrooms and the buffer zone, there is a glass partition that can be widely open so that the classroom can be uh, extended. The, this buffer zone is uh, gently separated from the circulation by the line of columns. So there is a corridor, a buffer zone, and a classroom. So three elements form a layout, layer of space that has various possibilities. Some teacher can make full use of it. Unfortunately, to say, some cannot. Compared to the adults who are frequently held back by fixed ideas, all children are very flexible. They instantly know how to use and enjoy the space. They find where they like soon, and they look very comfortable. And these children, he's a great baseball player, but he doesn't like to study, like place where many people pass by. And this is on the 35.5 above sea level. On this level, there are general classroom, special classroom, and library. And between classrooms, we made common spaces that provide the water facility, storage, and a closet for the cleaning equipment. This is on the 39.5 above sea level. And since this floor is relatively quiet, the consulting rooms that needed privacy are placed. And this is a roof plan. The color of the exterior wall is on one thing that we were very careful of. This shows the area adjacent to the construction site. It shows the pretty big sea walls and the gap of it. The sea wall was broken by the tsunami attack and the bottom part of the village. You see on the center part of the photo was washed away. And this shows the village before the Great East Japan earthquake. I happened to find this photo and found that the village was more colorful and more vividly than now. So we thought that the village must take such the variation of color back. Then we studied to research the color of the roof and the wall of all houses in the village. Then we integrated them into several colors. Then we tried to apply those several colors onto the roof and the exterior wall of the schoolhouse. There are two goals. The one is to add brighter atmosphere to the village. The other is to blend the project into the village. The way to apply color was a little odd. One color is applied on the walls that are enveloping one garden. For example, the color surrounded, surrounding the garden six was uh, bright beige. The color surrounding the garden five was pale pink. The reason of the color and the research of the color told us that the lots of houses in this village have more than two material and colors. On the lower part of the image, it uh, shows it. The reason is prob probably because the, they maintain one wall by one wall according to the damage of the part and how much they can pay for it. We found it was interesting. Then we tried to take over such the patchwork culture as one kind of bottom-up methodology. And this drawing examined how this project is blended into the village when it looked from the fishermen's on the ship. From the outside of the project site, 
uh, you can see the variety of colors. Uh, compared to the impression of from the outside, the atmosphere of each garden has the sense of unity. We also try to re restoration of vegetation in proper way. In the disaster area of Great East Japan earthquake, the confusion of the species of vegetation is very feared. The confusion is the result of the rapid reconstruction processes that demanded enormous amount of transplantation materials bringing, into, uh, bringing from far away. So our choices were to restore the vegetation using the young plants germinated from the seeds taken near the site and the young plants taken from near the mountain. The process of the restoration will be slow. However, it will make the string strong green. The hexagonal cardboard boxes shown in this photo uh, is the containers of the young plants. We also carefully examined the planting base. There are four steps. First, using the many uh, boring data, we researched what kind of stratum we can get on the surface of the new landform. Two drawings were overlaid. One is the architectural section, and the other is the geotechnical data. A second, we made a drawing showing the layout of the kind of stratum. Third, we made a chart that examined the combination of the angle of the slope and the kind of stratum. And each frame is unique and demands respective status of plants. Then fourth, we made another plan showing the layout of plants and ground covers. And this shows how the exterior work was finished. The layout of the plants and the ground cover follows the chart. So therefore, it may seem to be odd when you see the layout of the ground cover. Although it seems to be odd, I really like the patterns. The minimum number of trees were planted in order to make the minimum shadows until the young plants grow up. And for this project, I did only a few workshops with uh, local people and teachers. And this is because there were so tired of all of the situation after the disaster. So it was a very difficult time for them. So therefore, the, this project isn't said to be an example of the kind of bottom-up project supported by the simple participatory process. However, it seems reasonable for us to think that the wide range of examination, such as the landform preparation and the vegetation restoration, that beyond the normal architectural design work, were kind of bottom-up processes that must be done. And the reason is because they give the project the sense of richness and variety. Then again, I refer to the disturbance. I think the use of the civil engineering technology was a very strong disturbance for this project. And that was a very strong for both the process and the physical environment. So therefore, we struggled to recover it in several bottom-up ways as much as I conceive. In this case, the bottom-up ways it should be the very architectural, the arrangement of the building, the arrangement of height, the arrangement of soil and plants, the color, etc. And 
And this is the last image. I will wrap up today's talk. So today I introduced three projects. All of the projects have both top-down elements and bottom-up elements. And according to the project size, the phase of the combination changes. As far as the experiences of those projects is concerned, it is very important to unite the top-down and bottom-up organically. Furthermore, if the project allows an architect to make the top-down idea, the architect must, uh, must configure the top-down idea in such a way as to activate the bottom-up. Um, I just wanted to, well, um, while everyone thinks of their question, uh, I just wanted to start by asking one question, um, which was something you mentioned at the beginning with the publication um, about how your practice works together with your students to develop this body of research on little spaces. And I wondered if you could speak more about the relationship that you're encouraging between practice and education. Or how you're blurring the boundaries between them or how they can, your people working in your practice can get involved with what you're exploring with your students in the university? So basically the uh, practice uh, is always, uh, you know, having no time. And uh, it is very difficult for staff to do uh, 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 kind of research. So for me, it was very good uh, chance. It was a very good chance to do a research with students because Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I came a little bit late and I wanted to ask you a little, a little bit more about little spaces and um, looking at one of the projects you showed, if these little spaces are a way of building in a little bit of informality into the program or, or what you, I think you call them buffer zones as well. So I just wanted to know a little bit more about that. Yes, the, uh, the, the purpose of little spaces is there are several purposes. The one purpose is to make a kind of ambiguous space. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, always the school is, that, oh, oh, usually the uh, public school, uh, the function is kind of fixed. And also the uh, room, the purpose of the room is fixed. But uh, recently in Japan, the, the education system is kind of changed drastically. And uh, uh, we need a uh, more ambiguous space to provide a kind of more variety of education. Like, like uh, so sometimes the, we separate the classroom in half and some, you know, some group do more advanced study and some group do, do more basic study or something like that. So we need to provide the uh, more flexible, uh, flexible uh, kind of uh, flexible space to 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 adjust the adjust the the, the building to the uh, system of new education. Uh. Um, I just wonder what how you utilizing this type of diagram. I just want to know the intention. Because it's quite enjoyable starting from diagrams explaining position of contemporary architects. But in a way, I think it can be seen two different ways. One is you try to construct some sort of um, unexpected hierarchy. A bit like a diagram reminded me of Lewis Carroll, mathematic sense of, I don't know. So it's in a way, how, how are you, do you use this diagram to generate some ideas or um, summarizing your 
point of view. So I just wonder how mm. these diagrams could relate to your design. Actually, I made this diagram for this lecture. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's not my tool to generate my idea. But sometimes, of course, it is very uh, useful for me to, of course, structurize what I am doing. So. Mm, kind of. Mm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm in uh, under underconscious. <laughs> I, I underconsciously I think this kind of things. I hope. Mm. Uh, well, I just wanted to say thank you again so much for coming all this way and giving us such a great talk and. Um, Although you made these diagrams for this lecture, I think that first diagram where you show your position in relationship to everyone else should maybe be shared with the architectural community in Japan. I, I think the, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the first diagram, the four quadrant, quadrant diagram, is very popular. <laughs> 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 so I always use that uh, diagram. <laughs> so so that's already well known. <laughs> Well, it was really wonderful to have you here and to share all of this with us. And uh, we hope you come back again very soon. Thank you very much.